you're about to join Don Nguyen, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Nguyen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Nguyen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Nguyen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. Hello. What's up, Denise Simon? It's your buddy Don calling in for tonight's drive time sit rep. You know, um, I have felt a, a certain kind of, um, I don't know, sadness or detachment today. And based on social communications and whatnot, I'm not the only one. It's kind of like nobody knows what to do, you know? Yeah, I, I have actually not been looking forward to tonight's sit rep. And not because I didn't want to talk to you or spend time with the listeners tonight. There's just not really any good news that we can talk about when you, you know, because I know you're going to want to talk about the uh, the shootings that took place this weekend. We got to talk about China, obviously. We got to talk about North Korea. We got to talk about the media, I'm sure, hammering Trump, even if nothing else, over the fact that he misspoke uh, Dayton for uh toledo uh, toledo for dayton you know i I can only imagine how hard they're hitting them on something that stupid um so i haven't been looking forward to it but let me go ahead and welcome everybody to tonight's sit rep hopefully what denise simon is going to do is explain some of what's been going on for the past (coughs) three or four or five days and uh and maybe help us understand it and at the same time maybe shed a ray of sunshine on an extremely dark cloud right now in America. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drive Time Sit Rep. Most of you know that on one end of this conversation, you've got Denise Simon. On the other, my name is Don Nguyen. I'm in my car driving home from a long day at work. Denise is going to timestamp the show so you guys know when this conversation took place. And uh, and then we're going to talk for the next hour about Anything Denise wants to talk about, sometimes I'll interject a question and she'll run with it. So without having uh, to say anything else, because this, this, this is a black time right now. This is dark. Denise, uh, first of all, not to uh, attempt to add a little bit of, a, a little bit of humor to uh, what's going on, but Merry Christmas to you. We've committed to each other to say Merry Christmas, every drive time sit rep, basically throwing that into the face of liberals, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. So Merry Christmas to you, girl. And Merry Christmas to you. All right, let's time stamp it and let's start talking about the good, the bad and the ugly. Well, it's 8.33 p.m. uh, Eastern on the fifth day of August. In the year of our Lord, 2019. All right. Where do you want to start? Well, I'm going to start kind of in a very unusual place. um, Because we have the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell. And interestingly enough, back in April of this year, he said there were two things that were hurting the United States. One is what he calls the boy crisis. And the other is China. But I was real struck because I have been listening to professionals from the FBI to ATF to DEA to FBI... (laughs) to sociologists, all these people uh, uh, about these shooters over the weekend. 
And then I listened to a fella that had actually done a very long study, and he too called it a boy crisis. So I, you know, I looked up boy crisis, and here we come with our Fed chairman back in April. Hold that thought one second. Back up from the mic about an inch or two. Okay. I'm getting a little over modulation. Okay. So. Okay. Um, you know, he brings up this thing on 60 Minutes, interestingly enough, where he said that we have a crisis. And it, 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 we're unprepared for this. And it's not a crisis that came on suddenly. It's something that has been going on for quite some time, and it's not just the United States, but it's worldwide. When you look at those people that have joined Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, who were they? Young men. And when you look at what forced them into joining something, um, they often would tell you that there was nothing for them at home. There was, you know, some other kind of trauma or or crisis that hit their lives that they felt like they needed to join something um and then we have this whole attack on men you and i actually talked about this probably a year ago um but for the fed chairman to come out and say this was really quite remarkable and there have been all these studies because we have suicide rates we have uh, an opioid crisis where mostly um, it is the male, young males that are abusing narcotics. IQs are dropping. Their sperm count is dropping. Um, so uh, I would say that we have some factors that we're ill prepared to really address when it comes to young boys and this isn't just those that are 15 to 19 years old it starts actually earlier than that but it begins to manifest itself beginning at the age of 14 or 15 and goes all the way through high school and and when they go through high school what are they they're very detached and then they're often bullied. Um, and if you read the El Paso shooter's manifesto, he wasn't stupid by a long stretch. He was actually quite thoughtful. He broke things down in, in topics and in issues. Um, and, you know, he... he is very loyal obviously to texas and he didn't like this the hispanic invasion he called it yeah but, but you're maybe right. it was it was very well written yeah i, mean, I, was, and, I was shocked and, and i mean he went off on some other very liberal stuff you know with the universal paychecks and he didn't like corporations you know hurting the environment blah 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 blah, blah. but you know, they they decided that we're going to call it a hate crime, and he's being um, sent. I mean, he's being charged with a capital murder under a hate crime. But maybe we don't understand, and I'm not justifying anything. I'm just saying something about where he lived in Texas caused him to feel like there was some kind of real Hispanic invasion. So was, in fact, did he become uh, less of a person, less important, uh, less recognized because he, was, he himself was in the minority? We don't know that. But I think it, there's some hard questions to be asked there, and maybe that's what they're doing now to this, this fella. Um, so... Uh, I, I introduced that because I think this is going to be part of a wider problem. I've heard an awful lot about mental illness, but mental illness has a wide connotation to it, a very wide definition, I would say, 
that could uh, and, and inside of that we have some schizophrenia we have some bipolar we have some depression we have all these other kinds of things that I think people are ill-equipped to recognize and then admit so I preface this conversation about what happened in uh, El Paso and Dayton by suggesting that the audience might want to look a little bit deeper into what we would call the boy crisis and for it to come on the attention of the chairman of the Federal Reserve that he got on 60 Minutes and discussed it is really quite remarkable. Um, um, all right, let me let me ask you a couple of questions that that I think we need answers to. We may not have them yet, but what what do we know outside of the manifesto of the El Paso shooter? And what do we know about the Dayton shooter? And are there any any traits that you're able to see that are similar between the two? Maybe one or two. Um, the Dayton shooter was aware, and I, I, I kind of challenged myself. I wasn't too sure that he was aware of the El Paso shooting. But apparently on social media, when they talked about the El Paso shooting, um, he clicked like on his Twitter feed. So he was aware of it. The El Paso shooter spoke about the difference between an AK and an AR, and which he thought would be best. So this was long planned. Um, he went into a little bit of a diatribe about all of that. And he, he really felt like that he would uh, essentially die by cop, that he wasn't going to surrender, yet that's what he did. He surrendered peacefully. Yeah, I, I, found, that, I found that odd. Because he clearly stated that that's not what was going to happen. Yes. So he wasn't he also as... Mentioned, he, he also mentioned that he needed to go ahead and do this before he chickened out. Correct. And in some aspects, he ended up being a chicken. He, he did chicken out. Um, went very peacefully. Now, the... Dayton shooter was a whole different thing. This this kid was a Satanist. He was a Marxist. He was a Liz Warren, Bernie Sanders kind of person. The whole thing, and he obviously prepared because he modified his weapon. He had a drum mag that held a uh, hundred rounds. I think he had more than one because I heard today that he had as many as two hundred rounds. He only apparently got off about 41. Um, but he was... They, they both seem to have come from a family setting. But for the Dayton shooter to drive in his parents' car with his sister and allegedly her boyfriend, not that he was a boyfriend boyfriend, but a friend that happened to be a male... And she apparently was one of the first, if not the first, that he shot and killed, his own sister. Yeah, I had heard that. Now, we've got a lot of moving parts in all of this. And I've been trying to be very clinical at looking at all of this. The El Paso shooter on his manifesto had posted it on the, I would say, rather dark chat site called 8chan which is a like a, a, akin to the former 4chan and 8chan was hosted by a company called Cloudflare 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 terminated them as a customer today or yesterday 8chan went and found themselves another hosting company and that lasted about 3 hours and they got fired from there too so um, it, it was really quite fascinating because hey, one hold on a second, hold on, hold that thought and do me a favor, uh, for the sake of anybody that doesn't understand 4chan and 8chan, would you, would you go into that a little deeper? Well, 
those are two uh, sites that are really, for the most part, not moderated. Um, in some cases, they may have some intermittent moderating to see what's really going on out there. <laughs> but for the most part, you can go over there and have conversations with people. Uh, you get some kind of a following. Um, you, you get into these chat forums. You can post whatever you want to post. I mean, it's not like you go over to Facebook because, you know, you're heavily moderated and censored over there. Um, so it is a global channel, if you will, um, where you can say whatever you want and post whatever you want without any kind of consequence. Gotcha. Okay. Now, you remember the hacking group Anonymous who yeah. all of a sudden kind of came and went? They used to hang around 4chan. We have this new fella, um, QAnon, and um, QAnon had been part of uh, 4chan and 8chan. Um, I immediately, upon hearing this, traveled on over to 8chan, because I think I hadn't been on 4chan in a while, and it was the first time. I knew about 8chan, but I decided to go visit it, so I I uh, put in a manifesto, and I just put in there, uh, you know, um, active shooter kind of thing, and all of a sudden, bam, there was his manifesto. I read it immediately. Uh, I couldn't necessarily attribute it, make a, a confirmed attribution to this cat, but um, it was there, and then all of a sudden... It got out within, got a, a done like a New York minute. That manifesto became public within probably two hours, including to the FBI and, and to law enforcement in El Paso. Yeah, because uh, I read it. When did this shooting take place in El Paso? It was Saturday, right? Right. I mean, I was reading it without going to 8chan by 10 o'clock at night. There's a, uh, there are several cyber sites that are out there that I look at very often to see what's going on in the cyber world because I still think that that's probably one of the single largest threats we have to the United States, and it's the, less, the least sexiest, and it's the least read of any of the articles that I post on my website at foundersgo.com. People just don't kind of care about cyber attacks. Um one of them is a company or a cyber publication um, that, that, you know, they do their own stuff as well as, say, Cloudflare or CrowdStrike or any of these others. And this one's called ZDNet. And I happened to look at their site, and they had a piece on there about um, this cat and his manifesto in the fact that Cloudflare had fired 8chan. And the reason that they fired 8chan, and they said in quotes, because 8chan has harbored a community of hate. I was very struck by that. A community of hate. Don, I would argue that the very moment that Trump won the nomination, the community of hate was born in a very political way against Trump. And what have we had since? We have had those like Kamala Harris calling Trump a predator. Cory Booker just yesterday or today called, said that Trump is responsible for El Paso. Every single one of them uh, have called uh, Trump a racist. Don Lennon, Lemon um, in, the, in the CNN debate twice in the you know, as part of the panel called Trump a racist. And then you have CNN is a you know who had been going on with this prior to being a racist. He was a Russian operative, <laughs> and the Washington Post, the New York Times, and so on and so forth. So there's a, another 
a subset of community of hate. You see what I'm saying? Most so I, I argue that these politicians actually need to be a little introspective on where they were throwing gasoline on the on the fire of hate. They're pushing it. Um, they're encouraging it. They're manifesting it. As well, not only the politicians and the media. And so when Trump came out today, and I was pleased with his um, statement, I think he said what he needed to say, except he screwed up <laughs> between Toledo and, and Dayton. But I was pleased with what he said, <clears throat> including that he would be open to more discussions when it came to um, uh, what other measures can be considered for keeping weapons out of the hands of people that are mentally unbalanced. Um, but let's Which take I the, think we all agree with. You know? Well, <laughs> I mean... This stuff, while it's very convoluted and it's complex and it's a difficult situation and a, an enormous multifaceted situation, the bottom line is this. Those of us that are law-abiding gun owners, especially those of us that carry regularly or daily, we hate seeing this kind of stuff happen. Always hate seeing this stuff happen. And what we hate almost as much is the reaction, the, the, the mistaken reaction that comes out of the media and the left. Well, what you're saying is, is that good gun owners do not want bad gun owners. No, which is all you're going to have with gun control. Now... I mean, we can do the whole gun control debate. I mean, that takes on a life of its own. Um, but let me kind of go back to these politicians and this community of hate thing. Because I decided to, uh, I mean, one particular article was referencing the, the Anti-Defamation League, which was created to, uh, they're kind of a progressive group, but they were created to keep, people from always attacking the Jews. And so I, I looked at them and I said, okay, well, that's all they're going to concentrate on. They don't really care about defamation in any other, you know, sector of the population. So I looked at defamation and it says that defamation is a common law tort governed by state law in which an individual makes a, quote, publication of a defamatory statement of and concerning the plaintiff that damages the reputation of the plaintiff. Defamation comes in two forms, slander and libel. Slander involves the oral publication of a defamatory remark heard by another, which injures the subject's reputation or character, and libel is written is a written publication of defamatory remark that has the tendency to injure another person's reputation or character. So Correct. in in both cases, from slander and libel, we have media and politicians doing that not just to Donald Trump, but they're doing it to anybody that voted for Donald Trump. They're doing it to anybody who is supporting Donald Trump. They're doing it to the White House and any presidential action that Trump takes. All right, so, you got to hold the thought. You got to hold that thought. Hold it there. We got to go to break. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Drive Time Sit Rep with Denise Simon. My name's Don Newen. We're going to take two minutes and we will be back again. You're listening to the Drive Time Sit Rep. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Ladies and gentlemen, 
gentlemen, welcome back to the Drive Time Sit Rep. My name is Don Newen. You've got on the other end of this conversation, Denise Simon. I would encourage you to check out her website, founderscode.com. That's her personal site. That's where all of her great work is posted. Sign up, give her your email address. She's not going to sell it to anybody, but what you will get is emails every time she posts an article. So I encourage you to go to founderscode.com. Denise, it's fascinating that you've gone into this uh, libel and slander and defamation subject because about three weeks ago, I called our uh, mutual good buddy, Tom Del Beccaro, and I asked him, I said, there was a uh, gentleman that was, uh, I don't remember where I heard him or saw him or read him, but it was somebody in the media that was labeling anybody that uh, supported Donald Trump as a racist. And I said, Tom, why is it that I could not file a libel or a slander lawsuit against this man if I could prove damages that he caused to me either personally or with regard to my business? And Tom basically said, nah, nothing you can do. But I find it very ironic that you're bringing this up tonight. Well, it goes on. It goes be really beyond Trump and Trump supporters and Trump voters and Trump this and Trump that. Because I would say, let's talk about the Covington Catholic boys. Let's talk about what they did to Brett Kavanaugh. So, <laughs> there is the community of hate. And... I, I I think that we are, it, it's the 800-pound gorilla in the room, or elephant in the room, whatever the cliche is, that everybody is dancing around and nobody is really discussing it. It, uh, it, is, it is really quite remarkable that the left, the politicians, the Cory Bookers, the Kamala Harris's, for Kamala Harris to call him a predator, um, it, 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 to a racist, uh, I think Nadler even called him a Nazi today. <laughs> uh, uh, we, you can't ignore the fact that that is libel and slander. Now, did these two shooters, <laughs> the other word is triggered, and I don't know if that's a good word or not, but were, uh, were they somewhat... Uh, susceptible to well, triggered triggered is a good word sadly uh, i understand what you're saying but that's exactly the word you're looking for and so were they susceptible to all of this that caused a a inflection point in these shootings hence were they young men and they were to what, 21 and 25, I think, that um, were part of this boy crisis that it was been building, and they became so susceptible to where we have been in, as a country for the last two years that um, we are where we are. And I say that only because of the manifesto, or only because the shooter in Dayton was a Elizabeth a Warren supporter and a Bernie Sanders who both have said that this guy needs to be impeached. Uh, this is the reason for, you know, Trump being the worst thing that ever happened to politics, blah, 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 blah. Hollywood is saying it. And here's the other fascinating thing. The LA Times wrote or published a piece over the weekend that was a study um, that was done by the National Institute of Justice, which is a research arm of the Department of Justice. And they built a database going back to 1966, 1966 of every mass shooter who shot and killed four or more people in a public place. And this was really kind of remarkable, too. They came out with four takeaways. The first was that the vast majority of the shooters experienced early childhood trauma or some kind of exposure to violence at a young age. 
The nature of their exposure included parental suicide, physical or sexual abuse, neglect, domestic violence, and or mostly severe bullying. And these were precursors to mental health concerns, including depression, anxiety, or other disorders, including um, suicide. The second one. Every mass shooter had reached an identifiable crisis in the weeks or months prior to the shooting. They often be, had become angry and despondent because of a specific grievance. Workplace shooters had a job change. Uh, in other contexts, they, got, they were rejected in some kind of a, re, a, a relationship loss um, or somebody that had left their life that was... Maybe they're only conduit to some kind of reality. So there was a marked behavior change in them, including suicidal thoughts or plans and specific threats of other kinds of violence. Third, the shooters that they had studied sought validation for their motives. Validation for their motives, which you would get on 8chan. You see what I'm saying? Or 4chan. Right. And that because we're in a 24-hour news and social media cycle, it kind of adds to all of this. And, you know, people have found some kind of safety about sitting in their home, you know, with their tablet or their cell phone or their laptop, and they can go out there on social media and say whatever they want. And... They're, they're not going to, there's no consequence to it. The fourth one that was in this LA Times piece says, all shooters had the means to carry out their plans. Once someone decides that life is no longer worth living and that murdering others would be a proper revenge, only means and opportunity stand in the way of mass shootings. Only the means. Now, could it be to obtain firearms? Well, they've really never done anything that would keep them from buying a firearm or taking one from their parents, right? Correct. Okay. Now, here's the other thing I'm going to throw in here to, <laughs> as part of the discussion. <clears throat> and this is when we come to the most recent thing that is very close to my heart, and I know it is to yours, and that is these live birth abortions. Because Planned Parenthood has postured everything about the organization that a viable fetus going all the way up to live birth is into itself a monster. It doesn't belong. So life has no... The, the meaning, the value. They're subhuman. And we've heard that term, that babies in the womb are subhuman. That's what these shooters think of who they're, uh, of everybody else, and often of themselves. So we have a crisis. And Don, for the life of me, uh, of where I've been for the last, I don't know, 40 hours on all of this, I don't know where it necessarily needs to go. All I know is is that you've got a community of hate. You've got a sense of people that uh, are being labeled as Nazis, predators, racists, subhuman operatives. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, it is it is. I've never seen anything like it to the point where I think sane people have shrunk in their own world. Meaning, we, we are very cautious about who we interact with, where we interact, where we go, and we, when we do go out there in the world, we have our guard up like we've never had before. And we, watch our, with you more. And we watch our conversations, we, self -cen we, we censor ourselves, we measure our words, there's no freedom of thought, even if you think you have a thought. <laughs> that you want to be, uh, you know, as part of strategic thinking, you end up having to, what, 
uh, talk yourself out of it or someone's going to challenge you. So you just don't talk about it, do you? Well, I still do quite a bit of talking, but I understand what you're saying. And oftentimes you might tailor your conversation. Precisely. Where we never did that before and we never really worried about it before and we never really offended anybody before. <sighs> it's, it's, it's real troubling. It is real troubling. But uh, uh, on behalf of our audience and myself, thank you for that very eloquent discussion about what the, the tragedy that happened. And, and I doubt anybody else, maybe even any of our colleagues in our little radio world, uh, are, are uh, analyzing this and discussing this in the manner that you did. So a huge hat tip to you. Um, well, thank you. I'm just real... I, I was, I was, you know, okay with some of this. I mean, I was beginning to understand it and understand the work of the FBI. Because, I mean, we've got, I think they said like 850 similar cases under investigation now. And I was like, what? what? It can't be. But then when I heard Jerome um, Powell, the Fed chair, saying that there's a boy crisis... It's bigger than I really thought that it was. Now, let's take it another step, um, shall we? Because we've heard all of this about see something, say something. And I know that you don't have the time, and I don't have the time to sit out there on social media of any sort, being 4chan, 8chan, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Reddit, or you know, any of these others, and start putting in some keyword searches and start looking for people that might be of some trouble so we can go apply red flag law to them, which I think is now I've pretty much decided red flag law is un unconstitutional, but that's a topic for another day. So I sat here and I thought to myself, well, okay, wait, 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 wait. Who, what, what two companies can you think of right off the top of your head that have developed their own software algorithms that that um, are designed to look at patterns and keyword searches and then measure and score users' uh, traffic. Ding, ding, Facebook ding. Facebook and Twitter. And Google. Okay. Yeah. So, well, the FBI can trot on over to Facebook and Google and say, hey, would you write us a piece of software like algorithms, so we can go find something like the El Paso Shooter's Manifesto, and then we can go knock on his door. And I thought, well, they don't need Facebook and, and Google to go do that. They can just trot on over to um, the NSA. I mean, they can write their own code over there and <laughs> go find these things themselves. But wait a second. What separates us from everybody else is that we've got First Amendment. People should be able to put out, out there whatever they want to put out there. Okay, fine. But this guy's got a manifesto. Uh, we don't like what it necessarily says. Is this guy serious enough that he would go do something pretty nasty, pretty horrible, terrific? Well, well, based on the manifesto, he said he was going to do it. So at that point, he's entered kind of a new, uh, a new level. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this: how how long after the manifesto went up online did the shooting take place? That's that's a topic. We I mean that's a timeline we don't know. It looks like it was in within say forty eight hours, but we don't know that for sure. It could have been out there. For quite some time because he makes reference in the manifesto that he had been planning this and considering this prior to trump ever coming on the scene and then he makes reference to but fake news is going to tell you that this is all trump's fault and i'm here to tell right. you that it's right. not yeah. all right so he may have modified his manifesto so it may have been sitting out there for a while and then he modified it because he was 
you know, getting close to, to, you know, launching this horrible act. So, okay, let's say that the FBI went and found his manifesto and they knocked on the, on his door and said, Hey dude, (laughs) well, what is he guilty of? Because he hasn't committed a crime. And therein lies where I think we're on very shaky ground when it comes to red flag law. Because red flag law says if this person is deemed to be unstable enough that having a weapon would be injurious to himself and to others, we're going to take it away and uh, you go get yourself fixed. And when you get yourself fixed, come back to court and you can have your weapon back. Like we haven't, I don't think anybody's gotten their weapon back. But we're, we're delivering a punishment or a consequence to somebody who hasn't committed a crime. Mental illness is not a crime. <laughs> but making a threat is. Well, yeah, I guess it goes well, to the word intent. <laughs> yeah, well, you think? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's a, it's a crime to make a threat against a sitting congressperson. And yet, a, the majority of those that do don't even get charged with anything. Well, why not? Because the congressperson the just says, forget about it. Okay. <laughs> Explain that stupidity well and and, and so here's where legislation doesn't happen where you're going to have the democrats sitting on the house floor like they did what two years ago when you had about 15 or 20 of them that did a sit-in on on the on the floor of the house on on uh you know wanting comprehensive you know gun legislation okay yep well (laughs) This is where you can't necessarily have a piece of legislation that's going to solve all of these issues because they're not all solvable. Well, and as I have said countless times on this show, Cowboy Logic Radio and in discussions, there's no legislation that can be passed that can protect innocent people from acts of war and evil people. There's no legislation that can be passed to protect innocent people. Now. I would argue that a threat needs to be taken much more seriously. I mean, think about it, Denise Simon. As pissed off as you and I ever get, we don't make threats. We don't threaten to harm our political opponents or those people that we might disagree with. We don't threaten elected officials. We would never threaten a sitting president. Quite frankly, I'm not aware that I've ever threatened anyone. So why can there not be punishment for making threats? Well, the problem is this. You don't know who's going to fulfill the threat. So don't make the threat now. The flip side of that coin is, all right, New, and you, you want to make it a, some type of a, a punishable crime to make a threat against other human beings. Then all you're going to do is potentially silence indicators that we could, we could potentially thwart violence with. So it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, if I turn around and call, you know, you and I are in a debate, and I turn around and call you a racist, that's, that shuts down the discussion. It, just, it automatically does. Um, it, yeah, but that's not a threat. But I'm getting ready to say, you make a threat, and it does the very same thing. It changes the whole dynamic. And what the Democrats did to Brett Kavanaugh went way beyond the threat. Way beyond the threat. That was that was hate at a level that I've, I I I couldn't even believe it was happening on national television, 
and whatever happened that wasn't on television. The same thing with what they're doing to Trump and all these organizations. You got the ACLU, you got, you know, I mean, I mean, we just go on and on and on about these organizations that everything that Trump is doing, they're putting in court. They're suing for this, suing for this, and suing for this, and suing for that. So that is a level of hate right there. Um, <laughs> and, and and yet, I don't see a single thing, a single indicator that is going to change all of this anytime well, soon. Tough. It's very tough when you've got an entire political party and media that's actually doing that type of hate. Now the question becomes... How effective is this all going to be going into 2020? Oh, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg, Denise. You know, you and I talked the day after the 2016 election. And we prognosticated dead on balls accurately that immediately Trump, was going to be vilified. He was going to be stagnated through a quagmire of legal action. And that impeachment was going to be coming out of the lips of Democrats nonstop until someday, whenever he's out of office. And now it appears that they're going to go after criminal charges once he does get out of office. Well, I mean, they told us that. I mean, the resist movement was already happening. So, I mean, they told us yeah. they were going to do that. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, the first one that started blabbing about it at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, the day after the election took place, was Van Jones. He was the first one. Everybody else just looked like a deer in the headlights, and they were completely dumbfounded on how Trump won and crapping their britches. But Van Jones came right out and said exactly what you and I knew was going to happen. Well, I don't want this show to be a bleak show, but um, I would just say it's almost as though it's a public service announcement because of all the moving pieces of where these two shooting incidents, these two deadly shooting incidences are going to take us um, leading into 2020. Uh, And, you know, we're hearing things like weapons of war, you know, all these long guns are weapons of war. Well, you know, I can tell you that I I don't see a whole lot of people talking about the lack of long guns that are used in Chicago or Baltimore. Those are all handguns. Exactly. And I would exactly. argue that most of our deployed military in uniform in battle space are also issued a sidearm. Correct. <sighs> all right, you got about four minutes. Let's talk very quickly about China. <laughs> well, you only got four minutes to do it. I did a story today that is that is really quite terrifying and um, I titled it over at founderscode.com waivers China pharmaceuticals are killing Americans and Trump mentioned the other day in in passing and I, I may have been the only one that picked it up I had to go find it again that his friend President Xi said he would stop the sale of fentanyl to the United States. And he said, this never happened, and many Americans continued to die. We're losing thousands of people to fentanyl, is what he told reporters. And he's right. Um, Then I started poking around and found out that we have actually given China waivers. We're buying an awful lot of pharmaceuticals from China. And one of the places that we're using a lot of those pharmaceuticals is at the VA or in military hospitals. What? 
Okay, so then why, I went a little bit. Why did I know? Why did I know you were going to say that? Okay, so then I happen to find a piece from Bloomberg that says in one of the paragraphs, the t- title of the paragraph that said "rocket fuel." Rocket fuel. Well, we have this fellow who is a member of the U.S. China Commission, a military retiree, that said four of four. Four of his blood pressure medications were recalled in three months. Why? Because they were contaminated with rocket fuel. What? Okay. (laughs) So, then I trot on over to a buddy of mine who's been on my show many times, and he was a special agent with um, DEA for many years, recently retired, Derek Maltz. And I said, hey, dude. Today and I said, did it? It, it uh, in a simple for question is China its own drug cartel? And he said, "Yep." <laughs> so then I looked a little bit further, and I said, "How how can this be?" Well, then I happened to find an article from the South China newspaper or whatever that was, and said that. China, including going through Hong Kong, are providing the meth ingredients to the Mexican drug cartels. What? Of course they are. (laughs) Why is this not shocking? Well, the point is, do we want a trade agreement with China? No. I don't care if we do anything with China. In fact, I would put out a travel advisory through the State Department and say, the United States, if anybody wants to go to China... Forget about it. You're forbidden. We're not going to even allow you a visa. Then we're going to recall every single American that's in China right now. Get the hell out. We're finished with you as a country. Finished. Well, I think there's plenty of other countries that would like that business that's going to Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Drive Time (laughs) Sit Rep with the stellar Janine Simon. She failed to leave us on and up tonight, but there's always next week. Please go visit her (laughs) website, founderscode.com. Whatever channel or station you're listening to this show on, please tell your friends and family about it. Uh, We do this for you. We do this for you. Hey, mojo50.com. That's our flagship digital network. Got a lot of great shows on that network. We sure appreciate you hanging with us. Denise, take us home. Thanks for being with us, and God bless America.